Perfect. And we are going to begin. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Nicole Hemingway and I am the CEO of the U.S. Pain Foundation. We are so happy to have you here tonight to close out our Pain Awareness Month with a panel and Q&A discussion around why our pain counts. So our agenda tonight, first we're gonna go over just a few quick housekeeping items. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our initiative Pain Counts that was this past entire month to celebrate September being Pain Awareness Month. Then we are going to have a panel discussion with some incredible experts in the pain space. And then we will open it up to a Q&A. So some house items. First, please know that all questions will be taken at the end. And also we cannot answer any highly specific medical questions. To ask a question, and I'm sure that this is common now, we've been doing Zooms for quite a while. Uh, if you are on Zoom, please type it into the Q&A icon that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. If you are joining us through Facebook, please type your questions into the comments and they will be shared with us. Uh, at the end of the presentation during Q&A. The chat option is open for those tuning in through Zoom. We just want you to remember to be mindful and respectful of one another's feelings and experiences. And all of our webinars are recorded and posted to uspainfoundation.org backslash webinars. So please feel free to go there um, next week and you'll be able to find the recording of this panel discussion. A quick little disclaimer, this webinar is for educational use only. Um, we don't recommend or endorse any one therapy, treatment, or product that we might be talking about. If you hear information tonight, please go and talk to your healthcare professional um, to see what is right for your unique health situation. And I would love to just take a moment to thank our sponsor for Pain Awareness Month this year, Sunbeam. Um, it is always great to collaborate with you and we really appreciate your support of this initiative. So as I mentioned, September is National Pain Awareness Month and this year US Pain focused on the theme of pain counts. And really what we wanted to do was talk about the high prevalence of pain in the United States um, and discuss things that we need to be talking more about. We need to be looking at um, the burden, the obstacles that individuals are facing and bring back home the reason that all of our stories count, all of the stuff that we are going through is important and what can we do to hopefully improve pain management in the future. So we began the month rolling out an awareness video that really highlighted the prevalence of chronic pain in America. Over 50 million Americans live with pain. And in conjunction with that, we shared patient stories. If you have not seen this video, please go to uspainfoundation.org backslash pain awareness month. You can find it there. Other areas that we focused on was we had a weekly article that was relevant to the prevalence of pain. So we discussed healthcare disparities, multidisciplinary care, practical pain management tips, um, looked at the financial and emotional cost of pain and so many other things. Again, you can find all of those articles if one of those is very interesting to you and you have not read it yet by going to uspainfoundation.org. Um, and then we also really focused on daily facts. So we posted something every day on social media. A couple of those facts included 10% um, of all suicides in America involve somebody with chronic pain. 20 million Americans live with high impact pain um, that impacts their ability to, to work, to live, to function the way that they would like to. And that people with pain spend over $7,000 more on annual healthcare expenditures than people that don't. Um, we also have an educational handout that you can find. It has some great information that you can also share with either your healthcare professionals, your AR, AR excuse me, HR um, at your work, as well as friends and family to make them better understand the plight of chronic pain and um, how they can help be an ally for those of us that are living with it. 
So with that, I want to introduce our amazing panelists. And I am going to begin with Dr. Renee Green. She will be the Dean of the Cooney School of Medicine at the City College of New York starting this October. Dr. Green completed her anesthesiology residency, subspecialty training in ambulatory and obstetrical anesthesia, and a pain medicine fellowship at the University of Michigan Health Systems. She had a May Day Pain and Society Fellowship and was a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow at the National Academy of Medicine of the National Academies. Her health policy relevant and health services research agenda focuses on pain and the social detriments of health. Her federal and state board services are extensive and I'm only going to mention a very few of them. Some of them include uh, the National Academy of Medicine's Healthcare Services Board, U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee, and HHS's Oversight Committee for the National Pain Strategy, where she was a Disparities Committee co-chair. Uh, among her many other accomplishments, Dr. Green helped draft the National Pain Care Policy Act, which was incorporated in the Affordable Care Act. She was also the first to identify and write the foundational paper detailing racial disparities in hospital security standby requests on patients and visitors, while also introducing security errors in the health inequities lexicon. We are so honored to have her today. She is a true trailblazer and has um, been an advocate of people living with pain and really focusing on health and equities. And so thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Green. Thanks, Nicole. Very kind. <laughs> thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Amy Goldstein, MSW. She has been in healthcare field for over 25 years, advocating for the needs of people and families living with chronic conditions that include pain, cancer, multiple sclerosis, kidney failure, substance use disorder, and more. Amy is driven to promote effective advocacy work by identifying combinations of stakeholders who share interests and a desire um, to change the current healthcare paradigm. Through her company, Healthcare Collaboratives, LLC, she developed and currently directs the grant-funded initiative Alliance to Advance Comprehensive Integrative Pain Management. In her previous senior level roles at the Academy of Integrative Pain Management, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and the American Cancer Society, she oversaw numerous initiatives related to Alliance development, policy, advocacy, education, clinical care support, communications, and the patient family programming. She is committed to strategic thinking and finding meaningful ways to improve access to whole person quality care for all people with pain. Amy, it is always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and really shining a light on so many uh, areas and topics surrounding multidisciplinary care and more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. It's an honor to be here. And next, I have the pleasure of introducing Gwen Herman, LCSW, DCSW. She has dedicated her career to offering much needed hope to people living with pain. As she intimately understands their challenges, having lived with pain for over two decades as a result of a car accident. Frustrated by the own lack of resources for people with pain that she experienced, she founded Pain Connection in 1999, which is a national network of chronic pain support groups, support group leader trainings, and more. Over the years, Gwen has developed an evidence-based support group model that enables participants to harness their own innate healing abilities, take a more active role in their healthcare, and improve their overall quality of life. In 2016, Pain Connection joined forces with U.S. Pain Foundation, which I am so, so very happy about, and she has continued to expand these offerings. In addition to her work with patients, Gwen is also the co-author of the book, Making the Invisible Visible, a chronic pain manual for healthcare providers, and she has been featured in various news articles and projects about chronic pain. 
And in 2018, she was appointed to the Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee, which is one of the highest ranking pain policy oversight committees in the country. Gwen, thank you so much for being here. I just feel so privileged to be with all three of you this evening. Um, you're all experts in your own areas of expertise surrounding chronic pain and pain management and mental health. And I'm just excited to see how this conversation is going to develop. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to Gwen for joining us. I just wanted to say, tell you everybody that was me pre-COVID. <laughs> And since COVID, <laughs> hairdo has changed. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let me stop sharing Oops, my screen quickly. I, I think it is now just us, so this is perfect. So I'm actually going to start the discussion tonight asking Dr. Green, um, from your perspective within the healthcare system, what steps are being taken to address the severity and magnitude of chronic pain and really focusing more on positive health outcomes for patients? Well, I think the easy answer is not enough. Yes. Um, there's not enough being done. Um, you know, there are millions of people who live with chronic, acute chronic or cancer-related pain. Um, there are people who suffer, there have challenges with you know, getting uh, employment, getting access to high quality care. Um, there are a number of, of problems, but what I would also say, um, and, you know, we can talk to people like my colleague, Gwen, Amy, um, who can speak more about some of the specific patient related issues. Um, but I'd also say that the people who are racial and ethnic minorities and women um, have an unequal burden uh, of pain in their voices um, as it relates to the pain experience, as it relates to other experiences, go, often go unheard. So we have sort of awakened uh, a bit as it relates to the whole disparities conversation. Um, but I would say that there's still a problem that what we currently know we fail to implement mm. in any way. So if we could just start there with implementing what we do know about how to give high quality pain care, how to make certain that people have access to high quality pain care and sort of documenting those outcomes, that would be a start. So making the decision is, you know, it's gonna be a societal decision. With that being said, there's a lot of promising research um, that is going on in regards to sort of what we call phenotyping, actually sort of thinking about the pain characteristics, who's at risk, um, why are they at risk? Who does it work in? So trying to think about um, the evidence-based guidelines. Unfortunately, I would say that most of our pain research, we're probably uh, at least a few decades behind in the research that should be done. So we still need to be you know, asking the NIH and our professional organizations, um, foundations to actually funding worthwhile research. So that's one part. And then there's still the whole conversation as it relates to our health system um, in regards to, you know, our, our healthcare um, providers and the education that they receive as it relates to um, uh, pain, whether it being in medical school, whether it be in PA programs, whether it be in nursing. What we do know is that people, once they have a family member who has pain, that their whole conversation or they have pain themselves, that their conversation as it relates to people who have pain starts to change. And I would say that that shouldn't be the thing that changes the conversation. Um, and I would say, you know, actually, um, you know, we, we struggle with this a society with no pain, no gain. Um, there, when in actuality, um, that's a myth that actually needs to be rebutted. You know, the whole conversation as it relates to mental health of the person who has pain. I think one of the promising things is that, my goodness, people are starting to come out about their mental health issues. And so Gwen was talking about her hair having changed, but I think COVID has actually changed. You know, we've got a crisis. And so 
you know, the whole conversation as it relates to, from my clinic, seeing people who are starting to have the long hauler symptoms from COVID, pain is part of that conversation. And so we're going to need to have more research. We're going to need to have more education. And then after we have the research and we have the education, people are going to have to start implementing that. Um, and so if the care is not great as it relates to the majority population, um, there's specific challenges as it relates to racial and ethnic minorities. And also, I would say to women, um, and as to whose voices do we hear as it relates to the um, pain conversation. I hope that answered your question. It, it did. Thank you so much. That was uh, so much information. Uh, and so I actually think um, Gwen and Amy, I'm sure you have some things to follow up, but I know when you were talking about mental health, I was just thinking, Gwen, from your clinical perspective and background, um, what can be done to increase mental health, health practitioners' understanding of chronic pain? Um, and then also in light of COVID, what more can we do to provide assistance to people living with pain? Um, so I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so it would be following up with Dr. Green just said about the research. And then once the research is there, you know, we need the treatment and we need the money um, to implement all these treatment programs. So that's the main um, emphasis on, on that part. And then not only having that money, but um, getting insurance to pay for, you know, the treatment that, you know, we as um, chronic pain patients have. Thank you, Gwen. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say when you were talking about um, making sure that patients have access to the treatments that they need, I think that's a a great time, Amy, from, from your perspective, especially um, looking at the comprehensive multidisciplinary approach, um, what is the current state of patients being offered that? And um, do you see hope for more coverage of these offerings going forward in the future? Well, I, the million dollar question, right? Um, yes. You know, I think um, it's complex and you know, working in the space where um, the alliance I work with, because we we are bringing together kind of interests of stakeholders that represent people with pain and payers and purchasers of healthcare and whole spectrum of healthcare providers, government agencies, et cetera. It's been interesting thinking about, you know, the status because I have to share the fact that we work with so many stakeholders because everybody has a slightly different perspective on this because on on one hand i would say it's really bad it's just there it's not people with pain are not getting access to the care that they need and want in, in a comprehensive multidisciplinary way as a whole um that's certainly not the norm you know that we're seeing um, and especially when you start to get into, you know, so many other, you know, details related to, um, you know, what zip code you're living in, you know, what insurance you have, um, you know, what, you know, what language you're speaking, what, so many different um, issues related to, to how that, how that plays out. Um, there's also a lot of positive that, that's been going on in terms of innovation and progress. You know, multidisciplinary pain management, I think is, some of us may remember, there used to be many, you know, clinics um, that were multidisciplinary, many, many more around, you know, years back. And there still are, of course, and there is really, quality care happening in some of these clinics still, but things have changed a lot with coverage and reimbursement. And um, it's, it's really ebbed and flowed. Um, and, you know, what we're really pushing for too is, you know, interdisciplinary pain management or even transdisciplinary pain management. I know you and I spoke about this the other day, Nicole. Well, and I was gonna say, would you mind explaining the difference 
um, just for everyone to understand briefly what, what are the distinct differences between those terminologies and that type of care. I, I will, and then I'd love to hear from the panelists yes. with me, these esteemed panelists, their thoughts, because I, I think it can depend who, who's describing this, but ultimately, you know, multidisciplinary is working with different, you know, providers. Um, so you may, you know, be working, you know, have your physician, your primary care, um, you know, nurse, physical therapist, you know, psychologist or social worker who, you know, all are um, connecting with you, but they may not, well, but they're not usually connecting with each other about you. You know, it's kind of you're, you're, you're with them and it may not be in a coordinated fashion. So um, you, the onus may likely be on the person with pain to sort of put it all together, um, you know, as opposed to somebody kind of helping connect and coordinate that care for the best kind of order in, in terms of how you, how you would do it. Um, and then interdisciplinary care um, is when you've got a lot of the different providers, you know, in this similar scenario, but there is coordination around um, kind of the, the order and who you see and, and how you're connecting with those providers so that there's more interplay um, mm -hmm. with, with the actual providers. There may, you know, there may be care team discussions, et cetera. And um, transdisciplinary, I, there are some clinics and places that, that talk about this and, and I, and are doing a really um, amazing job achieving, you know, transdisciplinary and which is, is even kind of going beyond um, uh, where, you know, care team discussions are embedded, you know, into this and it is, it is completely patient centered and focused on the patient's um, situation leading, you know, the way that the care works and much more um, coordination and cohesiveness, you know, among, among the providers. Um, I, again, others would describe it, I think, differently than me. And I think there is excellent care happening in all, all of these scenarios. Um, I just think ultimately it can be hard for people with pain who have a lot of onus on themselves to have to put a lot of pieces together in their own care. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in, in what the other panelists, how they might um, think about that or describe those, those differences. Yeah, definitely. Uh, for me, you know, I've had chronic pain for over 25 years from a car accident, and uh, there was nothing out there when I was injured, nothing at all. And uh, so all of it started to fall on me. And the only reason that I found out, like all the medical language, is that um, after each doctor's appointment, I'd ask for my records. And then I would see all this terminology that wasn't said to me during the session. And then I would look it up and try to figure out what they meant. And that's how I learned I had myofascial pain and then fibromyalgia, <laughs> but it was never said to me. But um, yeah, but multidisciplinary is so important. And a lot of our, um, what we talk about in our support groups for US pain, is the importance of having a treatment plan that includes every aspect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not only the medical, but, you know, acupuncture, Reiki, you know, massage, everything, you know, cold heat therapies, um, medications, you know, for people to medical cannabis. So it's so important that we implement everything. And there's a rare doctor that really knows how to work in that system also. So educating doctors and young ones coming up is major importance, yeah. Thank you, Gwen. Dr. Green, do you wanna to add to that? So, you know, I think we've had many different um, innovations as it relates to um, the pain care. And, you know, I still believe that the best way to provide pain care is to have, and what we know, the data supports is multidisciplinary teams. Um, and lots of people taking a look at the same person. The challenge is, is that um, those, many of those clinics don't really exist like they used to. Um, 
And part of that is just um, financing, right? So um, even if we can, you know, get patients, sometimes we can get patients um, medications and we can't get them psychotherapy. If you really do physical therapy, the co-pays can be really very high if you have to go several times. So, um, you know, the, incentivize, the system incentivizes what it wants to incentivize. And not every patient needs procedures, but most patients will need some ways to address the psychological impact that pain has had on their lives. And so part of the work that needs to be done is to make certain people have access to all the things that we know have provided uh, benefits. With that being said, um, there are lots of people who don't have that. And those are significant barriers. And um, so pain is not well reimbursed um, in general, and we can do a better job. Um, and so I would encourage your listeners to the extent that they can uh, find clinics where there are multidisciplinary teams um, of people to sort of look at their chronic pain problems, that they'd be involved with those um, you know, that type of care. Um, with that being said, sometimes we cannot, even though the, the pain medicine physician is sitting next to the psychologist, people's insurance will pay for them to see the pain medicine physician, but they won't provide the psychological care or the physical therapy has to be done in a certain place, in a certain place that is not um, easy for, for the patient. So mostly just been care. It's not all about the physician, it's all about the team. And it's so interesting because um, for breast cancer, I think they do include talking, that doctors talk to their patients and they get paid for it. I believe that's something that I had read. So, you know, why isn't that happening in the pain field? Well, I think it varies. It, it varies. I think you can find some problems with you know, cancer treatment and, you know, who you can see is the psychologist. So they might say, you see the psychologist, but you may not see someone who's a psycho-oncologist who specializes in um, taking care of the patient or the person, not the patient, not all patients, the person who is living um, with a cancer diagnosis and has a psychological um, repercussions from having that diagnosis. The same thing happens for pain. So again, I think we need to work on how do we prioritize um, some of these other things that we know work for people who live with pain, physical therapy, psychological counseling. You know, then the one thing we haven't talked about is, you know, gosh, you know, here's drug A versus drug B. So if you fail drug A, then the insurance may not pick up drug B. Um, and for some people, it's not just, you know, they have a better commercial <laughs> on TV. It's about they actually do have problems with intolerance or certain drugs. So, or if you are on a lower insurance, they don't even offer certain types of drugs. So, um, all those things come in uh, come into play. Yeah, and, and and I would I would also I uh, of course completely agree and and would just add to that. Um, one thing I think that continues to evolve when we're talking about multidisciplinary care is, is just, you know, the evidence that has evolved in continuous quality improvement over the years of understanding more, you know, that multidisciplinary team has really changed and shaped differently. Um, I heard Gwen, you know, you mentioned, you know, all many different therapies that that people benefit from, you know, we're talking about, you know, individualized care that works differently for each person. And we're looking at guideline concordant care, meaning most of the guidelines out there, clinical guidelines are looking at many non-pharmacological treatments, for example, and um, looking at those first line as well. And then when you, and then when you kind of look at what coverage and reimbursement looks like for a lot of guideline recommended care, it's, it's really challenging because it's not there. And um, what's interesting is, you know, that we're seeing um, a lot of payers now kind of 
all in on this and looking at things differently from a data driven perspective, you know, where they are um, seeing the benefits of bringing um, certain therapies in earlier. And, you know, for example, um, there's been health plans that have made zero co-pays for physical therapy or chiropractic care for some musculoskeletal pain. And that has been, you know, to incentivize, you know, patients to do that earlier. And then they're tracking the results of getting into some of these things earlier and seeing that they're improving patient outcomes and decreasing costs overall, um, you know, where the trajectory of how um, people get get to these therapies can be challenging or, you know, now we know acupuncture is covered, you know, in Medicare um, for low back pain. But, you know, when you actually, I, I just was participating in a panel last week for um, a conference about the underserved and the realities are, it just isn't available for so many people, um, you know, based on where you live and what your insurance is, et cetera. And, and, you know, US pain, you did a survey that People told you, you know, massage was one of the number one things they wish they had more of among, you know, many other things yet, you know, you see massage therapy covered in some Medicare Advantage plans, but not, you know, Medicare Part B. And uh, it, it's just, it's not any one thing, but it's just that, uh, I guess I'm just trying to highlight that it's, it can be challenging. I think multi, I think we have to challenge ourselves to multidisciplinary care and what it really includes and how, um, how we can, you know, push. There are some programs that are doing some really innovative work with some bundling and different payment plans. And, um, you know, I'm happy to share highlights from some of those or send you links, you know, where there's, there's some really quality person-centered programs that, that look different, but are touching on comprehensive pain care. I think you touched on something. Oh, sorry, Gwen, I was just going to Go ahead. Quickly, quickly say, I think, Amy, you touched on something really important. Um, we have the pain management best practices task force report, which shows that the best form of care is multidisciplinary care. But then you also brought up the survey that we did last year um, around the barriers to multidisciplinary care. And individuals living with pain are not able to access that. And I think that that is something that um, is such a struggle for individuals with pain on how to get the care that they know is the best, but it is still unattainable. It, and so um, I think this is such a great conversation. I know that we're not going to find all the answers today, but just to be able to start having this dialogue and helping individuals find it. And um, Amy, I know that you shared a couple of those links with us about some of those programs out there that are working on this, and we will definitely be able to share those later on with those listening um, who are interested in finding out some more of this information. Um, Gwen, if you have, do you have something quickly to add? And then I was going to ask. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was just going to follow question. up to what um, Amy said about the acupuncture because um, you're only allowed to go to the acupuncture if a doctor's office is doing it. So if you go to an individual practitioner who's an acupuncturist who has lots and lots of experience and education, it won't pay for that. So it really has to do with the lobby groups of who is getting paid. Like it was interesting when you said free chiropractic and, um, you know, um, so it just shows you that if the massage therapy doesn't have a strong lobby, they're not going to get into all these different programs. But um, there was something else you were saying, Amy, that rang a bell. Now I think it went through my, <laughs> it popped through my head. Um, I'll probably come back to it later. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yes. So I, I do kind of want to switch gears slightly and talk about disparities in healthcare. This is such a needed conversation and so important and not enough is being done. Um, we know that disparities in healthcare affect everybody, but especially so with people with chronic pain. And so I'm going to start with Dr. Green because you have done so much research and have been um, an advocate and trailblazer in this field and in talking about this and making people aware of it. So from your perspective, what else can be done to really increase access and equity across the medical spectrum? So um, 
you know, the, the real challenge is that pain is a great equalizer. Um, so there's nothing like chronic pain or acute pain or cancer pain to put people into poverty. And poverty is one of the major or lack of resources um, is one of the major things that prevents people from getting quality care. One of the things that we do know, and we've shown this over and over again in some of our studies, is that, that for Caucasians, um, social class is protective of them, but it's not protective as it relates to racial and ethnic minorities. And so I, there is a lot of stigma. There's a lot of stereotyping that's associated with people of color. Um, and, you know, we have to get past that. So I think we start off by as healthcare professionals is actually understanding both our bias and our privilege. Um, and I think that's also true as it relates to Caucasians, understanding their bias and their privilege. Um, and it also relates as to how we think about being able-bodied versus being disabled um, in one way or another. I think we begin, uh, we also, so that's part one. Part two is actually starting to collect some of the data, looking at race, age, gender, class, and there are ways in which we can do that. Um, and then you combine that with looking at some of your biases um, and then try to step back and make certain the patients get good quality care. Now, the challenge is, the other challenge is that most of the guidelines we have been developed have not um, been looked at from um, the gendered or specifically through the lens of race and ethnicity. Um, very few, lots of studies don't actually even talk about what their population is when they develop, when they create these guidelines. So um, that needs to be better done. We need to understand what are the predictors for people doing well or having um, um, more of a terminal process as it relates to um, the pain experience. So there's a lot of work to be done. The other last point that I'll make, I think this is my last point, is that um, it is interesting how we have, um, as it relates to people of color, um, we've criminalized certain problems whether it be pain, whether it be the use of opioids, how we bring in those stereotypes. And when um, the majority population has that same issue as a medical problem um, and people have suffered because of that. Whose pain do we hear? Whose story do we hear? Um, a woman comes in with several children or, or even one child um, and we may dismiss her. Um, someone with a little dirt underneath their nails as opposed to someone who comes in with a tie. How do we look at the person who has privilege, uh, the person who, you know, um, has the better job, the person who has more literacy, the person who can speak the language. Um, so all those things, um, you know, come into play when we think about disparities. Um, I also think that we may need to start putting performance metrics around, um, you know, making certain that people get high quality care. Um, there is a history, so I've talked about this recently and from a historical lens, that as it relates to racial and ethnic minorities, that these um, disparities are not de novo, they come from someplace. And it comes from a long history of how we viewed um, the black and the brown body. And so, um, and how we potentially view women, but particularly um, the black and the brown body um, really contributes to this whole conversation as it relates to disparities. Yeah, um, no, that was excellent. Uh, but I also remembered what I wanted to say, which ties into what you just said, Dr. Brin, mm -hmm. about um, disparities in health. Uh, one of uh, we have a, um, seven specialty groups now, and one of them is LGBTQ plus communities. 
And one of the topics we were talking about was about <clears throat> going to your healthcare provider and how many people do not go because they're, they're, too, they're too vulnerable because of the chronic pain that they don't want to hear negative messages about their orienta sexual orientation or to have like comments made or you know, the stigma. And um, so a lot of people, when they do go to the doctor also, a lot of things are biased right there. When as soon as I think one client said they went in with their wife and the doctor was floored and, and didn't even address the wife or you know other times about somebody who is trans and uh, the doctor didn't know how to handle dealing with her health care. So um, that's really important. And, and when that's not taken care of, that's when depression goes up and that's when suicidal thoughts come in. And um, a lot of people, when they don't, if they're not getting served and they're not getting any relief, that's their only way of seeing something. So they're all tied in together. Yeah. And I, I know that Amy is going to want to jump in, but I do just want to say we're getting so many comments um, around this. And thank you so much. I mean, we're hearing proper health care should be a right, not a privilege based on income, social status, or discriminatory bigotry. Um, so this is something that is really touching a chord and um, striking a chord with individuals. And it, it's something that we need to continue having this conversation. So I just wanted to say that we are getting a, a lot of feedback and comments. And Amy, can you add some of your feedback and what you're... Sure, sure. I, I, um, I also wanted to add, I, I just, I had the, the privilege of, of participating in a conference last week. Some others may have too, but it was, um, it was called Integrative Medicine for the Underserved. And I'm just mentioning it because it's right in line with what we're discussing and, and what was, one of the things being talked about was, um, you know, lifting up models of culturally responsive and trauma-informed care. And I, I think, you know, listening to Dr. Green and, and Gwen as well, I mean, just racism in our society is also leads to trauma as well, even outside of any other trauma. And I think that it's, it's being sensitive and it's helping all the providers and others understand more about what, what is this kind of care when we talk about, you know, it's about moving from what's the matter with you to what matters to you and, and finding out how you can be, you know, culturally responsive. Um, it, it's difficult. And, and I just, I think we all have a lot to learn, you know, about, um, how we do infuse more of this into our practices and into our research, you know, methodologies and, you know, into our understanding. Um, I think there's, there, as, as others have said, there's, there's really a lot, a lot to do. And, and I will just, and, and this thing that um, I have been impressed by seeing some examples happening in, you know, like federally qualified health centers or, or other areas where typically these are areas where there is not much access to a wide variety of services and the kind of innovation and these non-traditional partnerships that are happening. I, I've seen in the chat, some people were talking about, you know, acupuncture and they, they loved it. And just as an example, we, um, there's a federally qualified health center in Austin, Texas, that has a long-term relationship with the acupuncture school in the area. And through a relationship, they're providing acupuncture for chronic pain back and forth. And these kinds of things are happening in a lot of places. So um, I think I shared that also for advocacy efforts that there really are opportunities to start to connect dots and link interests, depending wherever you live. You know, it's, it's about bringing um, these innovation and non-traditional, you know, connections together sometimes, you know, too. Yes. We did have one question that came up quickly in the chat and it was um, for Dr. Green and it was on this same topic. So I just want to ask, um, cause we've been getting so many questions, but this question was for you, Dr. Green. What do you recommend to change guidelines so they reflect the needs of people of color and others that have been historically excluded? Yeah, great question. I did see that question in the chat. Yes. 
Well, I think you have to go back to the basics, right? So um, major textbooks have talked about racial and ethnic minorities um, responding differently to pain. A lot of these studies have been informed by a Caucasian model where you compare black people, whatever age, to Caucasians as if the Caucasian is the normative. Uh, where the um, black or the brown is considered to be the defective. Um, and you went looking based upon a hypothesis that has been structurally um, um, included into sort of institutionalized as it, as it relates to racism. Um, and so I would say some of the hypotheses need to be reformulated for the 21st century. And we may need to go back and redo some of the studies that have considered to be foundational that have led to some of these disparities and hold some of our researchers, uh, potentially even me, accountable for the hypotheses that were driven by data that was based upon a racist or a sexist or discriminatory model. Um, and so you can look back to some of the leaders, which you call the historical figures in, um, in medicine, uh, what they believed about black and brown people um, and how we basically make the decision that we will, they, you know, even simple things like a baby doesn't feel pain. Well, the same thing was true as it relates to um, black and brown people in, who were enslaved. Um, so I think we need to go back. Um, we've published lots of papers. Editors need to be held accountable for their part in this, that they've um, propagated um, some of these stereotypes um, and potentially contributed to some of these disparities by publishing papers where they didn't expect uh, representation. And so, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the underserved and the whole conversation, you know, not, there's plenty of data of people who are people of color who have income, who have resources, receiving poor quality care. Um, so it's not equal. And so long, answer to the fact that it's not going to be easy. I do think we're going to need to um, collect data. I think we need to redo some of these hypotheses for a new generation. Um, we need to make certain, the editors and the journals need to make certain that, um, that there's representation uh, of women and minorities in the studies that they're doing. And if not, they need to explain why. Um, so, um, and then we need to, you know, think about how our biases have come into play um, as it relates to opioids, as it relates to um, who gets treatment, how do we make the decision about who gets their hip replaced and as opposed to another. If you're the whole conversation about if you aren't at this weight, we're not gonna replace your joint. Um, so we allow people to suffer as if in some ways obesity is their fault. And we know that people, um, that some people, some populations carry weight differently. And we're basing the whole conversation about what's normal on a model that didn't include them. So um, long answer to a very complicated question is a very um, good, um, excellent question. I should think about writing something about this, who knows? Yeah, the important thing too about the um, research when it's being done is that to have integration of patients there from diverse backgrounds also, so that they're there on all the different levels um, to point out where all the discrepancies are. And sorry, my animals are in the background now, my cat was before, <laughs> my dog. But, um, and then also getting paid for having patients being involved in research and getting paid for their time and you know for traveling and, and being able to be there but um that's also important in the research yeah well, well and, and 
Oh, and a quick comment on that too. I just add to carry that through on the research side. Um, so there's a government agency called AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Quality Research. And um, we, we did a letter to them when they were looking at the research behind, you know, integrated pain management programs, um, you know, essentially multidisciplinary pain management programs, and pointed out that the evidence was so low and the number of studies they had to, to pull from were so low and they did not represent, um, you know, disparities in healthcare in, in any way. And so, Kind of to Dr. Green's point, I, I she may not have meant something exactly like this, but I think we, you know we have to start to find ways where we're all sharing some of the same observations. Where this is, it just these are the kinds of um, studies and evidentiary reviews that then become biblical and they change the way the payers pay and they use these reviews and then they start to pay differently. So there really is. An important need for us to, you know, continue to focus around some of these, um, you know, areas where where it plays out. Yes, I'm going to go and start ask answering some of these or asking some of these questions because we've been receiving a lot. And my apologies, we will not be able to get to all of them, but we will try to answer them at a later date if we don't get to yours today. Um, one of the questions we heard is how would you begin the pain management discussion with your primary healthcare provider? Um, and I think that this might be more in terms of if they're, they're not receiving multidisciplinary care, uh, how do they bring it up? Uh, are there maybe resources that they can turn to for more help and assistance? Yeah, this is tricky because in some areas there are very few providers that deal with pain. So if you don't get along with this one provider, then you're left with nothing. Um, so it really, I think, depends where you live, of, you know, raising it. Um, I know when I go to the doctor now, I bring a whole, I bring like all, a list of all my vitamins on, supplements, medications, what I'm allergic to, um, so that they're aware of what's going on with me. And um, I give it to them each time, even if I see them, you know, 10 times, because I know they haven't looked at it. But um, it's a way that we can both talk and um, come to agreement. But um, I think I lost my train of thought again. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Yeah. Did any, Dr. Green or Amy, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. So, I'm just going to say that we know from some of our research that the disparities in care begin in the primary care arena. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of them, you know, people do deserve high quality pain care. They desire high quality care um, in general for any type of problem. One. Two, yet, um, you know, I hate to say this, but there are times in which our animals get better quality pain yeah. than some of the humans. Yeah. So I think it does require a fundamental reorientation. Um, I, you know, if you're having pain, you need to talk to your doctor um, or your healthcare provider. If you're having difficulty having that conversation, you need to bring an advocate. Um, you need to list those questions. If you still are having difficulty, then you may need to make the decision to choose a different physician. Not every physician or nurse practitioner or PA is designed to be your healthcare partner, you know, um, for lots of different reasons. Um, and you may have to make that decision um, to make a, a change. But I, you know, um, I say that with also humility. And the humility component is that for, for, for the people who live with pain, physicians have very little time to hear your story. And so the story as it relates to your pain needs to be focused. And that's not because they don't wanna hear you, is the fact that they've got several other patients waiting 
In order to do this, they often have to do it in less than 10 minutes, particularly as a primary care physician. I have the utmost respect for primary care physicians. Um, I love my PCP. She, you know, she's just terrific. Um, not every person is going to get that type of PCP, right? Um, I fundamentally believe that pain, people with pain can serve themselves a little better by how they tell the story. Um, they, in a clinic with house officers, fellows, you might have a longer period of time to tell your story. Um, but I, I, and it's hard for me to say this because I, I love hearing stories, um, but in the PCP arena, that may not be as feasible. And so you may need to think about what the pain is, what does it feel like, what makes it better, what makes it worse, even if you write it out for them. And I think there's lots of um, U.S. Pain Foundation, um, other organizations have, you know, ways in which you can talk to your um, PCP, right, Nicole? We do, yes. We offer um, advocacy programs. We teach people how to effectively communicate with their healthcare providers. Uh, we have a few articles out there. I know a lot of questions we have been getting so far is how do I find a doctor? Um, and we will put that in the chat, a link to that article um, on different ways to find a doctor if you do not have one in your area and you're searching for one. Um, and then there's been a, a lot of chatter too, just around the CDC 2016 prescribing opioid guidelines and the new draft opioid guidelines that just came out. And um, when we're, we're talking about health and pain management, multidisciplinary care, there's so many tools in our toolbox um, and medication is one and it works very well pain medications for some individuals and they have not been able to get uh, the medicine that they need to help their pain. And so US Pain Foundation does have right now an action alert that you can reach out and share your experiences with your policymakers. Um, and we'll make sure we put that in the chat. But I also just wanted to open up sort of that question because we've been hearing that too, um, uh, just sort of surrounding um, medications. And if you are no longer able to receive them, what, what can you do? Do you have any other options? So, um, you know, I'm looking at somebody who says, I haven't had a PCP in years because I have so many doctors already. You know, I, I still, I, as difficult as it may be, you need a PCP um, because too many things can be missed. You need somebody who can coordinate your care. And that's the reason why we need to think a lot more about patient-centered medical homes for people who live with chronic pain. There are physicians out there who have a good wealth of knowledge as it relates to internal medicine and pain care. And so uh, we need to find a better job or do a better job of helping to identify those type of um, healthcare providers and also making certain they get reimbursed uh, well for taking care of um, you know, people who have these chronic pain problems. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Um, but um, that's the next part of advocacy, right? Um, we need to find ways to keep, you know, good doctors and, and providers in the field taking care of people with pain. You talked about the opioid guidelines, you know, the, you know, these are a challenge. Um, they're, they're, you know, we don't want people having problems with addiction. We don't want having people overdosing on these medications. But with that being said, there are some people in which opioids work for them and they work really well. And that you can do this in conjunction with good quality care. What we need is more data uh, on them. Um, you know, do recognize that opioids can cause problems, but so can anti-inflammatories. You know, um, overdose, you know, taking too many of those can cause problems with kidneys, particularly in po populations who can't, one, they're populations who can't take anti-inflammatories, and two, they're those who have um, cardiac issues or renal problems. So we don't have the magic bullet as it relates to taking care of people with um, acute chronic and cancer pain. 
Um, so we do need to have all these modalities open to us. Well, That's a good point. All these different types of ways to, in which to treat pain. So I know that we're going just a little over. So I think I'm just gonna ask one more question. Um, and we've just been hearing from a lot of people tonight sharing their stories of their doctors, not understanding, not listening to them, potentially marginalizing or ignoring, marginalizing the pain or ignoring them. What, and, I, and this is gonna be, I'm gonna ask each of you this, but what can they do to be taken more seriously? Um, and then should that be their job? It, it's Which, just patient's job? Yes. Oh, if you can't advocate for yourself, then, you know, really well. well. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, come on. I mean, it, it's, this is one of those things, you know, the better informed person. So the better informed person does better, you know, in the whole conversation. You know, there's another person who's saying, you know, I've had all these different procedures. Um, and none of them help. Well, you can also say not to, <laughs> you can stop putting these medicines in my body. They're not working. Is that's the time in which you may need to get a second opinion. So patients do have a choice. And first and foremost, you need to advocate for yourself. And if you really can't, then you find somebody else who, who can or will do that for you. Um, so I hope I answered that part of the question. Was there another part? I did. No, and I think that is so great because I think one thing that is so hard for people with pain is that they lose their voice through, through the journey. And I love how you said, if you can't do it, try to find someone who can on, uh, for you and help you find that voice again. Yeah, I'm, I'm sometimes a little too direct, but you know, the, uh, yeah, I mean, so you must be able to, now sometimes people can't advocate for the stuff that cancer or something of that nature, but to the, you know, and there, there is something, you know, so let me give you one piece of advice. There's something very powerful. I tell my house officer this all the time. There's something very powerful about taking away people's clothes and, and putting them in that gown. Hmm. I think you start to take your power back by after somebody examines you in the gown, that you come back, you say, wait a minute, before you start telling me the plan, I need to get my clothes back on. So you start putting, giving your power back. Um, and that's one small little thing um, that people can do. A lot of people are awed by the doctors, less so than what they were maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, but you have to have your own voice. You need to be able to be what I call self first. Advocate. Yeah, you know, uh, Dr. Green, I'm going to just have to say that um, I understand what you're saying, but it's really hard for a person who has chronic pain, who's traveled to the doctor's appointment, who's, who's um, full of expectation about, about the appointment, what's going to be said. Um, the pain is escalating, it flares up. It's really hard a lot of times for people to advocate for themselves. And I used to take my husband with me you know, during those times, because I knew it was too much information and I was flooded by the information from the doctor. So I needed another set of ears to hear me, I mean, to hear for me and to let me know what was going on. But there were times when he couldn't come or somebody else couldn't come and I had to go by myself. And it's easy to say to advocate for yourself. You know, when, when I, I could say now that I'm much better, oh, I can just go in my, on myself now. But in those years after my accident where I was a complete wreck, it was hard to advocate. All I can say was I was in pain and, you know, please do something to help me. Yeah. So I just wanted to bring that awareness of, you know, people at different stages of their pain of what they're like when they go into a doctor's appointment. Yeah. So Gwen, that's how you advocate for yourself by saying to the doctor, you think she's wrong, right? <laughs> so, me, me. Well, yeah. I'm not saying completely wrong. No, I understand what you're saying and what you're saying is ideal. No, it it's is. great. But for, there's so many people, like when people come to our support groups, usually it's the first time they're telling their story and they, they just break down. And that's what happens when they go to the doctor too. They just break down. And one time when I was at the doctor and I was, um, I broke down crying, he wanted to admit me into a psych unit. So it's, it's really, 
yeah. you know, goes by, you know, the person and the provider and what stage they're in. That's why I just, that's what I wanted to say. And, and when I would, I, I don't want to be dismissive at all. I'm saying that people get better care when they can advocate for themselves. Yeah. Sometimes, I agree. you know, you have to um, realize that sometimes, you know, we're pretty human too. And so we have good days and we have bad days. You don't know what's going on in their lives as well, right? Um, and I certainly have had my good days and my bad days, hopefully more good than bad. Um, but, and sometimes you can peel on somebody's compassion, right? You know, um, but there's other times in which really the person needs to really advocate for themselves. And if, you know, um, you know, if that means you take your partner with you or you take your sister with you, then you need to do that. And, you know, you know, if you were a cancer patient, they often have people who are navigators to help. You might always ask for a social worker to help advocate for you in that setting. Um, so I, I am hearing what you're saying, but I think first and foremost, being self first, you really do need to try to advocate for yourselves because I think that the failure to sometimes advocate for themselves also can lead to really lesser quality care. And that's not where we want to be. So advocating yes. for yourself, meaning having a partner or somebody else do it with you. Does that make sense, Gwen? Oh yeah, it makes sense if you're at that place. <laughs> that's what I'm just saying, that there are people sometimes come into appointment, they're not at their place, you know, psychologically. So it's hard to say exactly what they need. Yeah, that's what that's what I was just trying to say. Yeah, no, well, and I think saying, that's why this conversation is so important, right? Because and bringing people to this place and letting them um, find that power again to advocate for themselves. And I think the more we can have these conversations, the more um, uh, programs and resources and assistance that are out there to help support people with pain so that they are able to advocate for themselves. Hopefully that will also lead to better outcomes for that individual and that they get the better quality, the quality care that they deserve and need. Yeah. Well, the healthcare system has fundamental challenges. It, 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 you know, the lack of time to see your healthcare provider, the lack of numbers, the lack of diversity, you know, lack of pain education. You, you know, so I hope that I understand that people who have chronic pain, acute chronic cancer related pain, are coming into an imperfect system more reason than I think that people need to advocate for themselves and educate themselves to the extent they possibly can. Now, I recognize the times in which you're just sort of broken and you're you know, bruised and things of that nature. And in that situation, you know, um, education helps. Um, and education may mean that you're bringing someone else with you to advocate for you. But this, the, our healthcare system, and that's part of the reason why I you know, chosen the new position that I have is that it is broken in many respects. And um, I don't think it's irrevocable broken. Um, I'm talking about healthcare in general. Pain care is particularly problematic because we don't have a pain meter. We can't just sort of tie up your arm, listen to, you know, okay, what is your blood pressure? Um, you know, there's some diseases where there are sort of sine qua non for, um, you know, what that disease looks like, you know, like CRPS, things of that nature. But most times we don't have a pain o meter and the pain is what people say it is. And then we have to compare it to what people are functioning. So it's particularly problematic for this population. More reason to educate yourself. And let me, while we're talking about education, you know, um, Dr. Google is often wrong. Um, and so I'd really encourage people to go to high quality websites. You know, a lot of people are paying a lot of money for things that, you know, are shown at late night TV uh, when people are most desperate, um, you know, that will take away your pain, uh, make your life complete. Um, we need to be really careful 
The NIH has some really good information. You know, clearly the U.S. Pain Foundation, there's some other organizations that have good quality information, but there's a lot out there that is sort of really um, trying to swoop down on people who feel a little desperate or a lot desperate. And so we need to actually sort of push back on that, make sure that we get good, high quality information, get, educate ourselves well from good sources. Yes. I, I definitely, definitely agree. Amy, did you just want to add anything? And then I will be wrapping up. I, I know that we're over our time. Sure. I I really appreciated the discussion. I, I will just kind of agree and concur that in terms of um, advocating for, for yourself and ensuring that you're reaching out to somebody else who can and who can care is so important or even even writing things down or practicing beforehand, you know, for all the points being made, you know, around um, how important it is to make sure that the time you have with your provider is well spent. But um, no, I, I, nothing else. And I just have really appreciated the conversation and uh, US Pain for making this space. Well, thank um, you. Also very much. For those that we did not answer your questions, I will stay on afterwards and try to type in some of those responses. Um, one thing that I would just want to say again, thank you to our sponsor Sunbeam for uh, supporting our efforts this Pain Awareness Month and making sure that um, that pain counts. And some of the things that we really need to start focusing on, and this was touched upon by Gwen and Amy and Dr. Green, is greater research, research into the causes of pain, um, an increased focus on collecting population health data among ethnic groups um, and also by location, um, which have been neglected for so many years. Um, and then also just overall um, better training and better understanding by our, our healthcare providers uh, regarding pain and, and maybe the dissemination of the pain management best practices task force report. That is always something that is very important to U.S. Pain Foundation, looking at multidisciplinary care. Uh, and then from the patient perspective and the person living with pain side, uh, helping those individuals find the tools to advocate for themselves and to find the support that they need along the way. So for everybody tuning in, I encourage you to go to uspainfoundation.org to find um, ways to get involved in advocacy, to find support groups that are going to help you. We also have, we've been talking a lot about multidisciplinary care. We have a great website called mypainplan.org where you can go and learn about 80 plus uh, treatment options um, in different seven categories of pain management to really assist you along the way. Um, to our esteemed panelists and guest experts tonight, I, I truly appreciate uh, the conversation, your time, and your assistance to really uh, talk about this, this really important discussion that we're just not focused on enough. And um, it definitely gives me hope just seeing uh, the experience and the passion amongst all of you that the change is going to happen. It's going to take a lot of us doing it. And so the more that we can amplify the conversation and the more that we can work together and have these difficult conversations and start that conversation, the better. So for everyone tuning in, thank you all so very much. Um, and to our speakers, to Dr. Carmen Green, Amy Goldstein, and Gwen Herman, thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, and goodbye. I will now just start typing away on some of those questions that people have been asking. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks you. to everybody who tuned yeah. in. You're so kind in your comments. Such a <laughs> good to see all of you. Wonderful to be with you. Yeah. Really, really. Bye-bye, uh, everyone. Bye.